Welcome to Café Rodis. Today I've got someone I never had the pleasure of having a conversation with, so it's going to be completely fresh. Maybe we're going to find out that uh, uh, Jason doesn't like me at all. I hope it won't be the case. <laughs> Jason, could you introduce yourself for the listeners who might not be familiar with your work? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Jason Pitt, uh, Genesis of Legend Publishing. I am an indie game designer from Canada, and I may be known for some of my games, including SIG, Manual of the Primes, After the War, and I just released Palanquin, or Palanquin, depending on your pronunciation. Um, I also run the RPG Design Panelcast, which has a large number of panel and seminar recordings about game design. And uh, for Kix, I also was one of the early members of the Indie Game De Developer Network. So I I've been around for a little while. Amazing. I think uh, I should check your, your panels uh, a bit more. I mean, I'm in the process of developing my own, my own very first game and playtesting it. So I'm, I'm sure oh, there's fantastic. full of good advice in there for me. I I've got um, uh, two ice-breaking questions. The first one is, uh, what is your routine like uh, at the moment in the current uh, COVID-19 situation, if it's not indiscreet? Uh, so I am working from home. Um, I currently work for the government. So um, I'm doing my best to help move the bureaucracy forward. Uh, however, it's always a exciting and stressful time uh, because uh, we just don't have the tools to be able to be fully efficient. Um, and it life in the time of pandemic is always bizarre. So um, now fortunately that means that I get to spend even more time cooped up at home in front of my computer working on my various projects so I can distract myself and at least feel productive to some degree. Well, that's, that's good news. It's really weird indeed. I, I, we take, took advantage of our, uh, not, not mandatory yet, but uh, authorized one hour of exercise outdoor to have a walk. Uh, we, we're not too far from the, the city center. And oh my God, there's a lot of music outside. The, <laughs> We, we had a walk all the way to, to the Thames and the, the HMS Belfast, which is this big boat. And I, I, I'd forgotten, because I, I'm lost with dates and days, that it's V-Day today. And first of all, it, oh, was, yeah. it was quite eerie to stand there next to the Belfast, which is a, one of, in the area and it itself, it's a very touristic landmark. And there's usually a lot of people and they were just like... A handful of people, really. You could run a, a game of a role-playing game for all the people who were within my <laughs> sight. And suddenly, really suddenly, I, I would have thought I would have heard, that, heard them coming from far away, but very suddenly we had the Red Arrows, which is a acrobatic team uh, of the... Whoops, lost your video. An acrobatic team uh, uh, from the, um, the Royal Air Force rushing there in formation, I don't know, seven planes with the colored smoke and everything. And it was just so eerie to see that there but be almost alone to see that. It was like, yep. did that really happen? I felt yep. very uh, emotional. It was like, you know, I almost almost cried because it sort of dawned on me. You know, those walks are nice because we, we see a different side from the rest of the week. But then it dawns on you, yeah, the, the situation or, or where it is. Yeah, I mean, we just had the... Um, uh, the snowbirds, which are the Canadian equivalent of that, um, uh, I think they called it um, Operation Comfort or something along those lines uh, yesterday. Comforting. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, and the other half of it is because as a professional in this industry, I would normally be going to a lot of conventions. Yeah, we got UK Games Expo cancelled here. I mean, it's been postponed and now it's officially cancelled. There's still MCM Comic Con, which is not only... Uh, I don't think it's been confirmed yet that it was cancelled. It was delayed, meaning Critical Role would not come anymore. 
and then the convention center got turned into a makeshift gigantic <laughs> hospital. Uh, so it's really weird to see this picture and say, hey, that's where people cosplay, except it's, it's I don't know, hundreds of beds uh, w with respirators next to them. Whew. Yeah. Um, so I'm on the board of directors for a local convention. Uh, and uh, I was probably going to be going to um, Gen Con this year. Uh and right now, I'm very uncertain if I'm going to be making to it my way to the November Metatopia convention. So that's a thing. Um, so a lot of these gatherings are things that are both professional in that I would go there, run panels, sell my books, etc. Uh, and social. There are some of the times that I actually get to spend time with some of my friends and professional colleagues um so yeah it's exciting um uh, but it's very disruptive but, yeah i imagine i mean metatopia i've never been there but i heard a, a lot about it uh, including people in in panels i run here in the uk saying that we should have one in in europe in or something similar but i imagine that not happening would be a a big void where where the beating heart should be in your year of professional design. Yeah. Huh? <clears throat> um, I mean, for scale, I am. I prefer to go to Metatopia than Gen Con. Gen Con's got uh, this reputation of being very large, and that origins is it's still there in terms of scales as well. But uh, it... yeah, uh, Gen Con is huge. Uh. And it is the heart of the game publishing calendar for a reason. Um, usually there's decent sales. The booth is crowded and full of so many people. Uh, it's probably ru running at 60,000 uh, sorry attendees, which is pretty respectable. Origins, last I checked, was at around 15,000, uh, which is still a lot. <clears throat> 15 to 20. Um, and Metatopia is a thousand. Um, oh, nice. So, and, uh, for those who are unaware of Metatopia, it's over in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, every November. And it's a game design and development convention. Uh, so there are panels, uh, uh, specifically addressing niche topics of here's how you use agile uh, project management in your game uh, <laughs> projects. Or uh, I did a fun panel on xenobiology uh, a year ago um, where it, this is how you make up alien ecosystems for your games. Okay. Uh so it's always a lot of fun, and there's some very high quality playtesting going on. So I was watching a bunch of games that later came to Kickstarter show up on the Metatopia man uh, panel schedules a year or two before they dropped. Wow! So I I heard about Thirteenth Age before Thirteenth Age came out. Cool. Because uh, oh, it was on the. It was on the schedule. Not, not too long ago, I took part to a, a French, um, because obviously in France, there well, are <clears> a lot <throat> of places that this situation. And uh, in France and in other places, uh, it, it created a, a, a very interesting reaction. They created CyberConv, which is an online convention. And I must say, I've been extremely impressed with what they pulled off in a in a few weeks uh, i think part of the reason is that you had people involved in different conventions suddenly bending together online and <coughs> being this proactive uh yeah so i i recorded a, a couple episodes with, with them so i i would recommend anyone who's considering running a convention online to to check them out and maybe reach to the organizers but do you think that's something which could happen with metatopia or even the convention you are you are running uh, having a, a version a virtual version um, mine, I know that there's some people who are organizing, um, a little, you know, a few games, but, um, 
board games are harder. The miniatures games are nearly impossible. So it's just the RPGs that really work well in the art, uh, online format. Metatopia. I, there's some elements that could certainly work. But the organizing lift associated with that is extensive. So, uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, no matter what, there, we're going to have some conversations about games during that period of time but we'll see exactly how that shakes out yeah yeah it's it's exciting yeah it's i mean what i find fascinating at the moment and uh one thing i've seen with uh, that convention is how there's a, there were a lot of people as you mentioned the infrastructure at your work to, to work from home and so on and there, there are softwares there, there are a lot, lot of tools people need to learn and so on but I've seen sort of the opposite with role playing games I saw people <coughs> coming with tools from their workplace to run their games <laughs> yep. so, so now I mean this little group we, we're going to play each Thursday and they introduced me to something called Miro which is for collaborative work it, it, these are dashboards and then I realized right. that with that, I could run my game online despite the fact that you needed pre-printed cards which you hand over to the players and then they fill them out right. and then they trade them. The, I mean, the, that's just one tool among many, but it's quite impressive to see yeah, people being inventive. And you, you got, compared even to a couple of week, months ago, uh, there's much more to playing mm. online than, than Roll20 and Fighting Fantasy now. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's a number of really interesting games that are designed in such a way that they work well online. I mean, the classic one is View Screen. Oh. Uh, which, if you haven't heard of it, or for folks who haven't, it is a horror game where you're all playing different uh, members of a science fiction crew. Uh, I believe it's a science fiction crew and there's some other skins of it. Uh, so you have, you can only communicate via the video chat and there's overlays and various uh, effects and constraints on how you can do it. Um, but it's specifically designed to be on video. Uh, uh, actually one of my games, um, Palanquin, which I just released is, uh, designed in such a way it coincidentally works perfectly online, even though I designed it well before the pandemic dropped. Uh, <laughs> I was not expecting that it would happen to be a good uh, online game, but, well, it is. Um, and uh, just to selfishly plug the game, it's a... The pitch of the game is uh, the heir to the kingdom... Uh, has escaped the palace after a palace coup. Mm -hmm. Now a group of disreputable uh, individuals are helping escort her to her aunt's uh, palace. Uh, so it's all about the escape of the 14-year-old uh, uh, princess surrounded by the uh, uh, the disgraced veteran the sorcerer who might have killed their master, uh, the thief uh, who is captured in the dungeons, etc. Uh, so, but it's designed such that um, there's no actual character sheets per se. Your characters don't change. It's just dice uh, that are being rolled and uh, preset characters with sort of leading questions. So it actually works decently on the online format. Cool. So, uh, so Palanquin, do you carry around uh, literally a... Uh, Palanquin, these are those... How do you call that in English? Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's not the name... Um, uh, don't remember what it's called, the thing you carry for, for individuals, or maybe two individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so it's not... It's um, metaphorical rather than literal. Um, because, uh, so all of the disreputable people who are helping escort the princess, the heir, um, are called the bearers. Okay. And as you go at, um, 
it actually takes a little bit from um, Kagematsu. Uh, in that uh, one person is in charge of judging everyone else. So as you go through the escape, it is certain that you'll get there safely. There's no question about that. The real question is, Does the is the air going to trust or fear each of the individual bearers? Because they're all a little sketchy. <laughs> and, um, you know, for scale, uh, one of the characters is the Faithful, who is a priestess of the um, goddess of rivers and sacrifice. Sweet. <laughs> so sacrificial priestess uh, is not usually the most trustworthy of uh, saviors. So yeah, there's a lot of distrust that winds up uh, cropping up and that that's sort of the fun of the game uh, figuring out exactly how good or dangerous your individual bearers are it's when I, it, it makes me think that uh, it's sort of uh, yeah you have the princess and then the group around her it's kind of made up of uh, Matt Martigan from Willow uh, yep. <laughs> it's totally that. Vir it is totally that. Viren from the Dragon Prince and had a third in mind. <laughs> yeah, those kind of uh, fishy character. Who, the the tension is. Uh, I mean, even like Maui in uh, in Moana, we're not quite uh, sure. Zuko. This, uh, oh, Zuko. Oh, Zuko. That's yep. a nice one. Bonded by honor or or to all their own personal uh, griefs. Yeah, that's so, yep. that sounds awesome. I like the concept of. Uh, and I, I was first exposed to that through a game you recommended uh, to Willem. So the, my group on Thursday includes Willem from Ice Cream from everyone. And uh, the first time we played together, when they introduced me to Miro, we played Becoming, which uh, oh, right. apparently you, you put in his hand and told him to buy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like this concept of you're not going to fail. The hero is not going to fail. So th that means you... You're very comfortable both as the person playing the, the protagonist or the, the everyone around the table about making the situation quite bad while there's the agreement that it won't fail. So it will succeed, but we, we can load you with a lot of difficulties <laughs> and it's about how those will be overcome. Uh, that's a very interesting way of liberating the, the players and, uh, and what is going on in the story. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I, I love uh, Becoming. It's, uh, for those who are um, unaware of the details, it's modeled, it's a game by Brian Engard, uh, who w worked on Fate Core and a number of other games. Um, and it's a game modeled on the Greek heroic myth. Um, so there is one hero, and there's three uh, uh, furies or fates. So the so they are in charge of creating all the opposition and all of the problems that the hero is facing, and they make bargains with the hero. Uh, so um, you can always uh, it's because it's based on uh, effectively uh, the maiden. Uh, the what's the middle one? Oh, uh, can Made in Mother Crone. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, one of them can create things to help the hero. One of them, uh, and usually has side effects. One of them can change things to help the hero, and one of them can destroy things to help the hero. Uh, but there's always side effects always. and it's effectively the three of them trying to fight over who wins and you have turn playing them so you, yeah the, the concept is what you need four players so that's a game the number of players is preset you, you don't have a choice as yep. far as I, I understand it so one plays the hero and uh, that person's going to play the hero all through the game while the others turn doing the three uh, the maiden the crone <coughs> and um, yep. the, the third one so, so the, the, 
they're gonna do the different things at one moment, uh, each of them. I really enjoyed, I, I'm not a big fan, uh, not a big fan, I'm, I'm saying that not as a criticism, but uh, I'm fine. I'm listening to a lot of podcasts with a lot of people enjoying a lot, very storytelling game, really games when you come up with a story together, and uh, uh, over my little own gamer journey, I realized that it was not my thing most of the time, because it reminds yep. me of work. I'm, a, I'm an architect, oh, right. so designing uh, as part of a committee is part of my work, but there's a hierarchy and so on, and playing storytelling game where you share the narration, it reminds me of not even my job, but my studies when there was no hierarchy, so no, no leadership. <coughs> so, but right. I really enjoyed becoming because you have a very clear role at the moment yep. when you contribute to it. You cannot, you're not invading there's no too much friction with what the others are, are doing. They, they are informal exchanges, but it's very clear what you're supposed to do and what you do, and, and the, the other person makes their contribution behind you on that. Because when I play storytelling things, I always have the always have this impression, which are, doesn't have to be justified, but either I feel like I had a good idea and I I didn't push it enough and it was not taken by the group, or the opposite had a good idea and I argue for it and sometimes I feel like <coughs> I'm I'm pulling the spotlight too much but I always this got this slight paranoia of this but yeah with becoming yep. and games which are very structured uh, I don't have that so it's much more enjoyable for me. Oh yeah, absolutely absolutely understand that. Um Yeah, there there's Spotlight management in a decentralized game is always a challenge. Um, now the question is, is it landing on the players or is it landing on some kind of central administrator uh, to try to make sure that those uh, tensions and problems don't crop up? Yeah, yeah. So I, I definitely understand. Um, by contrast, my day job is... Uh, a bureaucratic hierarchy. So <laughs> collaboration is amazing. I'm a huge fan of that. I, I I know exactly how huge hierarchical systems uh, uh, and top-down management works out. And uh, I don't need that in my fun most of the time. <laughs> Although I find role-playing games, I mean, it's, it's no wonder that it, it's used in training often but what I find fascinating with I, I learn a lot through playing role playing games like um, Legend of the Five Rings which was probably the first game I was exposed to with a very top down hierarchy and in the way we used it we, it was partially randomized because we, we would roll uh, our ancestors randomly but then you end up with a player who usually is the uh, a good player, but the bandwagon, uh, and that yep. player ends up being the one with the most glory. And because the game master was very strict into applying so, so the etiquette and the codes, saying, "Okay, when you enter a room, the person with the most glory is the person t who's supposed to say the things and speak first. So, but you learn about, okay, what is it like to you have someone on top of them? You need to provide them with the advice, but, but in a fashion which doesn't undermine them in front of another authority and this sort of things. And it, it's really, really cool. I really like it when a tabletop role-playing <coughs> game allows you to, to explore such challenges and try to understand, okay, what is it like actually to be the person in charge of of planning or education, the education board in, the, in this administration? What does it mean? Think, when you play some role-playing game and you think a bit further... Uh, yeah, you, it gives you a bit this kind of perspective of ah, oh, they cannot say whatever they want, <laughs> or, or or you cannot just go up to them and say, well, this thing you did sucks um, in front of of the rest of the board if you're their subordinate because because it's a problem for the whole system. On a related note, there's another fantastic game uh, that deals with that kind of conflict, which is um, uh, Kingdom by uh, Ben Robbins, uh, the creator of Microscope. Cool. And uh, it is a game where uh, you divide up the authority. So one person it has the power, so they make the decisions. One person is the, I think it's technically the guide, uh, who says 
what the uh, potential consequences are of a decision. If you uh, uh, take an option or refuse an option. So you load up consequences on both sides. And then the third one is effectively the populace who decides what public opinion is <laughs> Sounds cool. and whatever they, whatever they do or behave or however they behave in play represents how people think about the situation. So you'll get a situation of, should we welcome the barbarians into our kingdom? Uh, one person has the ability to decide it. One person gets to say, uh, but if we uh, welcome the barbarians into the kingdom, they will take over our military because they're, they have a better martial spirit. And then the populace is sitting there going, oh, that's totally fine. We don't want to serve in the military. <laughs> uh, so then you get the person in power saying, so do I want to in, um, bring in the barbarians and give them all the swords? <laughs> the people say I should. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's examining those kinds of conflicts in a uh, de delightful way. Um, I'm actually quite impressed by all of the uh, games produced by the publishing company, which is Lame Mage Productions. Lame they Mage. also did uh, Follow, uh, which is a ga very good intro game uh, about quests. So it's, it's all of their games are quite good where you can just play them off of reading. You read them at the table and you go straight into play. Cool. Oh, so that's, um, that's awesome in, <laughs> in many and situations. And Follow is specifically designed to be very easy to pick up, teach some fundamental skills um, with no prep. Um, so uh, I definitely recommend folks check it out. And um, if if you have any new role players, start with that one before D&D. Don't start with D&D. Like you can go to D&D, don't get me wrong, but start with something like that that has a really gentle uh, learning curve that guides people into it, teaches people to um, be um, comfortable making bad decisions for their characters and um, taking risks. Um and collaborating, etc. So that reminds me, yeah, I was it... yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> That's re it's a side note, but that reminds me. I was thinking to st uh, we had a discussion on a previous episode about uh, uh, controversial opinions, and I was saying that uh, from what I see on Twitter, actually having a a controversial statement was the best way to to get anything noticed because people tend to <laughs> get up in arms. So I was wondering if I should uh, each time with my guests make up a clickbait title for the for the, the episode. Like something which we would not even defend in the video but just to to have the, the episode shared uh, shared and uh, so maybe I will call this one You should never start with Dungeons and why you should never start for for Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I yeah, I understand that I think I'm, I'm going to try. I see if I have enough space for. <laughs> I'm not aware of the the length of title, but I'm going to try to. Well, D and D. D and yeah. D would short, shorten it nice. But yeah, nicely. I agree with that. I, I it really annoys me. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's a, I'm a broken record on the subject, but I like D and D really. But it really annoys me when people suggest that as the first game to start with, because I even if it was only for the 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 pull effect of that. Uh, black hole gravitational pool, the, which is the the D and D community. D and D, you're gonna play it one day, so you don't have to start with it. Play with something else, and and then it's not. I find it it's a, a bit of a sandpit. Uh, again, it's not a a judgment of the qualities of the game, but it's compared to others. It's it might be simpler than it used to, but it's still very complicated. And I find the assumption of a lot of D and D players that oh, I spent all this time being onboarded on D&D &D and getting to know the rules that now if I want to play another role-playing game I'm gonna have to do all of that 
all over again and even and no even something traditional or old like Star Wars D6 it's much faster to learn than D&D so you don't have to spend it's funny to run the games I've been running games at a club and then there was no D&D and everybody's D&D players there and each time I was running something people would ask me oh where can I head the, the player's handbook for that game or can I have the rules in advance and each time I was like you don't need that. <laughs> you show up, I will tell you. That's it. Um, now, if someone does want to run D&D, um, so I've just been... So I've been playing games for a little bit of time, let's say. Um, and I started off with, like, RuneQuest. Nice. Uh, I, I am too young to have started with RuneQuest, but I had a classic... DM. Uh, but it meant that I've been tracking pretty much all the editions. Uh, my uh, my pet edition is Second Ed. Uh, mostly because I adore some of the settings and some of the things they were trying to do, uh, like Planescape or Dark Sun, um, like that, or Birthright. Like there, there is some really interesting stuff going in there. Um, but I recently, um, picked up an actual copy of the red box, uh, online, um, which for folks who aren't aware was the classic mass production 1977 version, I believe, uh, 77 or 79. I don't recall the specific year. Um, but, um, the, the mass market, uh, version, uh, by, uh, Metzer. Um, and it's really good. Like, Keep on the Borderlands uh, is the fundamental adventure. You know, you've got uh, th I forget if it's three or five levels. Uh, Elf is a class. That kind of thing. Um, and it's actually really well designed. Um, there's a really nice holding space the complexity isn't too high. Um, it gives enough tools for people to be able to dig in uh, without constraining too much. So it's a uh, you are all adventurers who's been got who's who have been sent to this keep on the edge of the kingdom, just the kingdom. <laughs> um, and uh, there's problems in the caves. So you need to go in. So you go in and you deal with the caves and there's an ecosystem of the, these caves that are all connected to each other. So if you clear out one place that had goblins, then the trolls will come in. And it's, you know, this constantly dynamic uh, dungeon setting. Uh, you've got some simple tools. Um, the mechanics are quite straightforward there's a handful of spells for uh magic users that kind of thing so it's it is actually the D, &D i would recommend starting with um as opposed to the games that were at the advanced dungeons and dragons or later stages um it would actually be lovely to make some tweaks to 5e to specifically reproduce some of the more gentle onboarding elements mm -hmm. of uh, the red box, because there was some there was some really good tech in there that people aren't fully aware of. Um, like uh, one of the controversial opinions that was popping up online, which I yeah I have opinions about, is the whole. Um, racial attributes mm -hmm. and uh if you are a dwarf you get negative charisma modifier uh if you are a um orc i think it's what negative intelligence modifiers uh and how a lot of this is tied into some rather unpleasant racist elements um that have been baked into D, &D for a long time that's not actually baked into the red box. Really? Wow. So in the red box, 
the way they handle it is um, all of these classes and races, which are all the same thing. So you're taking an elf or you're taking a fighter. <laughs> uh, they all have prime requisites that get you bonus XP. So if you are a strong dwarf, you advance more quickly. But it's a, you get a benefit if you are this. And you must be this good in certain stats to be this uh, class or race. Mm -hmm. But it's not all dwarves are strong or all dwarves have high constitution. It's a, if you have high constitution, you're probably better suited as a dwarf. Which is an interesting dynamic um, that I think lessens some of those problematic elements. So, yeah, I, I am a fan of digging through some of the older games and seeing what's on the old uh, gems were. Um, even though I'm a hippie story gamer. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, some, I think that... That's... Uh, at the moment, there's kind of this. There, there, are, there are things which are like race, which are clearly justified that people take issues with. But in narration, in general, there's kind of a conflict between, on one side, the tropes of stories, which are there to to foster communication and understanding in what you're trying to do, and then the rejection of those tropes, uh, sometimes on uh, ground which is justified because it's hurtful to to people, but sometimes. Because oh this is to so tropey why why do we have those tropes well those tropes are there f for communication so if we're not happy with them we need to make out make make up other tropes on which you, we can build yeah uh, I mean they are <sighs> any shorthand that is coming out of our culture means that it brings along all the baggage from our culture welcome to Tolkien's greedy dwarves uh, who have a lust for gold and a big uh, nose. <laughs> or, uh, or big nose gnomes uh, who are all tricksters uh, or the orcs who are um, savage uncultured uh, beings who uh, who raid and commit vi uh, acts of uh, deeply unsettling violence from tribal structures uh, on the edges of civilization. So we should really come in and, you know, yeah, that, uh, that's problematic. Bring civilization to them and remove them from the land. Oh, yeah. There's there's a lot of issues from a lot of our cultural stories that are be, that found the tropes. So. As uh, a fantastic game designer, uh, Avery Alder, said, um, when you're designing a game, um, uh, all games have politics. Yeah. And if you aren't putting your own politics in them, you're putting in someone else's. Yeah, because even the absence so, of politics is is politics if there's such things yep. uh, well, your your impression your delusion of making it void of politics actually is a a support of a form of politics which are in place huh? yep i mean imagine a oh and in this world there's no politics politics don't exist <laughs> you know what that is <laughs> that's paranoia no? <laughs> uh no no that's got politics uh, no, I mean, no, there's no politics. A, it, there's no, there's no mutants. A, there's no mutants. Word. There's no traitors in power. Um, there's no, <laughs> right. But if there is, if there was a communist, <laughs> have you met your one? Left, look to your right. I, I shall denounce one you if you follow. One of you, you is a communist. <laughs> um, then you need to uh, recycle them. Um, yeah, uh, but if you had a, this world has no politics. Uh, that's a libertarian Mad Max situation. It's funny because this world has no politics is almost... I mean, even interpreting that is so... It's, it's a Pandora box because this world has no politics. Okay, is it a complete libertarian Mad Max world? Uh, or is it a the opposite? 
because when you said this world has no politics, I was picturing more 1984. There's there's no politics because there's just one politics. There's no debate. There's just do the things, uh, and it's clear what you're supposed to do, and you do it, and there's no problem. There's no politics. Yeah. So even the interpretation of the statement <laughs> is open to interpretation. I mean, I think there's only one fictional group that could legitimately be be seen as having no politics. Mm -hmm. Who would the that Borg. be? The Borg. They don't have internal politics. <laughs> yeah. There, there is no vote. Yeah. We but are the Borg. Resistance is futile. That is their internal dialogue. <laughs> I heard of someone at Cyber CyberConf who developed a game which was a bit like playing the Borg or or the insects in Starship Troopers and you were right, part right. of the thing and you would upgrade yourself. But it would be quite interesting to picture how... Yeah, you know, that, that's a role-playing challenge to put yourself in the mindset of a Borg. Or, or would you role-play that? I guess you would not role-play a Borg. You, you you would do it again like Becoming or... Uh, well, you uh, you so collectively play the collective and you take turns at doing an aspect of it, I guess. I like the idea of... Um, slightly different, but the Geth from uh, Mass Effect. Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with. They're Mass a collective. Uh, so they're a collective of um, synthetic uh, beings um, that may have overthrown their masters and uh, led to a migrant refugee flotilla uh, <laughs> holding all the all the surviving creators. Um, that sounds very because, apolitical. You know, they were, <laughs> because they were in, uh, they had effectively been enslaving and abusing the artificial intelligence robots as servants. So, yeah, okay, like yeah, that's fair. Um, robot revolutionaries, what can I say? But their internal politic is actually all consensus. It's direct democracy where every member of this uh, hive-minded uh uh, robotic species it, you know votes on everything which is a really interesting well, like, that's, that's political not, blocks within a hive mind that's not where, consensus then it, it's uh, majority democracy with I well, guess it, no the thing it's the thing is it's a now let's we're going to use the speed of machine intelligence to have societal level debates mm -hmm. until everyone agrees on a course of action okay so it's uh it's like but it but because you're not humans you can actually do you know the equivalent of ten thousand years worth of debate and yeah. say murder is bad and everyone agrees because you've been talking about it for the equivalent of 10,000 years. And everyone, okay, yeah, you've convinced me. So it, it's a system which is like 12 angry men, actually. You, yeah, yeah. Everybody needs to agree on the verdict, not just a majority. But as you say, you, you can process it so fast that yep. you, you dab it over and over. Like, like question, I mean, we, we talk so much about uh, stuff which pulls us apart in society, between countries and within countries, but partisanship that we we forget we're still quite a lot of stuff we agree upon which yeah. if you go 30 40 years back in time most people <laughs> wouldn't agree with them so yeah if you had a thousand years that could definitely work yeah i mean but how would you role play that child labor is not a thing that most people are enthusiastic about anymore which is and that's wasn't the case for what, years ago 100 years not even. Um, I'm sure. Depending on your jurisdiction, like. Yeah, I think people would feel like it's 100 years, but uh, the reality is, uh, well, first of all, it's not as uncommon in the world, or even in some countries, uh, civilized countries, as we would think. And second, people, I think, would would have the delusion that it's been like that for 100 or several hundred years, while it's in place mostly since World War Two. 
you know, and, and widely accepted culturally, but People still... Well, sorry, by child labor, I'm talking about, like, eight-year-olds in coal mines. Yeah, well, of course, there, there are ranges uh, of which what... is about 100 years. I mean, at what point is, like, taking potatoes in a field or sewing things in a, a sweatshop-like environment as bad as being a coal miner? I mean, coal mining, just the condition of coal mining. I come from a place called the, the Black Country in Belgium, uh, yeah, coal mining, and it, it's in 56 they had their last very big tragedy which put an end to the industry but uh yeah <laughs> it's it's terrible where will we yeah. start where we are coming from then? <laughs> uh politics and dnd politics that... leading to child labor because most of us agree that that's a bad idea <laughs> and it only took a, took a you know a hundred years to generally get on board with the like no let's not throw kids in coal mines um give it ten thousand years you can actually see some progress put time on it but <laughs> we'll see and uh, yeah i'm working yeah we'll moment. come back in ten thousand years <laughs> um Okay, uh, are you so what's the work the, the project you're working on at the moment? Is it Palenquin? Are you or are you done with it and you uh, moved on to so something else? I just finished Palenquin, gorgeous, yeah. Um, Mia Minnis is the new artist who uh did this for me, uh, she did some fantastic work. Um, it was part of Zine Quest. Oh, uh, which seems like it was ten years ago and was actually in February. <laughs> yeah, we uh, had a February this year. I, I thought we only had a, a March. Well, it, we had a February. It was about a hundred years ago, but there was a February. Well, the good um, news, like the GIF, that we know we agree on a lot of things, I guess, because February <laughs> was a hundred years ago. Uh, I was actually saying online that I legitimately forgot that an entire uh, continent lit on fire in January. Yeah, me too. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the, 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 there, was, there was this joke on TikTok that uh, uh, March was like, oh, pandemic. And April would be like alien invasion. <laughs> oh, we do, we could, we're happy we're done with March. What's go? The year cannot be worse. And people were starting to picture all oh, things could get even worse. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Yeah, and then they found, uh, released UFO pictures. I mean, yeah. uh, so yeah, there's a lot has changed since February. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I just finished that off. Uh, so right now I'm working on... Uh, so I'm um, in charge of the layout for a glorious project that went on Kickstarter last year, I believe. Uh, Red Carnations on a Black Grave Since... by Catherine Raman. Okay, what is which that is, about? Uh, it is a story game about the um, rise and fall of the Paris Commune. Ooh, that's that's uh, honey to my ears. Yeah, it's it is delightful and tragic. Um, so <clears throat> let's put it this way: one of the characters is um, uh, Camille, who is a twelve-year-old uh, child, uh, and uh, Camille has a question of uh, so. Um, who taught you how to shoot? And the two icons representing Camille are a pistol and a teddy bear. Yeah. And like, oh, that hurts. And everyone plays two characters in like this relationship web. You are guaranteed to have at least a 50% fatality rate. You're guaranteed to lose at least one of your two characters. Yeah, it's uh because well, guess what? La semaine sanglante was not a pleasant period. 
No, the the past is not great. I love I, I love oh. the I I don't play nearly enough and I don't find they pop popular enough. But uh, story inspired games are I things I find absolutely <clears throat> fascinating. Oh yeah, um, Night Witches does some beautiful work. Uh, Gray Ranks it is an oldie but a goodie. Um, uh, for those who aren't aware of Gray Ranks, that is the uh, Polish child soldiers in World War II. In the Warsaw Uprising, uh, by Jason Morningstar, because of course it's by Jason Morningstar. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, interesting historical games going on. This one I had heard of. I think it was uh, in. Um, I heard about it in uh, Bonix Experience podcast, uh, which I too was really fascinating. I'm not sure I could play it. Uh, I think uh, it. It would be too much for me, but just the, the idea that this game exists and people play it, it's called uh, Rosenstrasse. It's yep. by uh, Unruly Games. And you play, uh, I might have the details wrong, but apparently the, the inhabitants of a street which existed in Germany where you had a lot of uh, uh, mixed unions between uh, people yep. of Jewish des descent and people of uh whatever that means non non jewish descent uh and and the the inhabitant of that street uh, apparently the the women especially managed to uh sort of argue their way around the laws and uh, a lot of the repression but at the same time that that meant that they had a lot to make a lot of um uh, yeah very difficult decisions and at the same time uh yeah how do you deal with what's going on around you and uh, Anyway, your your own life is not is not at all safe. Uh, yep. Uh, but yeah, just hearing talk talking about this game, it's it, it's a sort of thing. That's how, to some extent, I find history should be taught, because it's about the experience of the past and not not the facts, which very often are are not as factual as people imagine. Oh, absolutely. Um, so. Uh... For some additional detail on that, the game is published by Unruly Games and designed by Dr. Jessica Hammer, uh, who is a friend of mine um, and a professor of game studies, I believe. Uh, technically, I forget if it's communication or game studies. Um, but uh, yeah, so she designed the game as a Jewish creator. And it's all about uh, non Jewish. Uh, good German women quote unquote good German women in the eyes of the Nazi party so you know Aryan women who were married to Jewish men and they would effectively uh, do the equivalent of walking up to the Nazi regime and saying I want to talk to your manager <laughs> um, and said like I am exactly the correct the kind of good german woman you want and you're not taking my husband away so they're using their social power as, by being part of the dominant group and browbeating the nazis who are all who also happen to be german men uh so yeah they they're protecting their uh, Jewish husbands from being taken away. It's really interesting and dark, uh, but fascinating. There's so many time of history, and, and again, you know, sort of putting yourself in the situation in in a, in a safe environment that we enjoy today. I think it's it's much more meaningful than uh, yeah. I mean, it's. It's great to lay flowers on monuments and so on. I mean, it's Victory Day today, but yeah, it's it. I find it, yeah, important and not covered enough to to try to to put some, you know, just even for for a few minutes, put yourself in uh, thinking very very hard what it's like to be to be someone in another circumstance. Not in the sense that oh yeah, we have it so easy today, but yeah, you know, un understand that. Uh, well, first of all, the past isn't. A great place uh, most of the time, and and second, I think t for empathy, you know, it's it's not even I'm saying that it's not even necessarily history, but just understanding what could be the other p 
person today, circumstances and how they they cope with the situation and uh I think that's something which is interesting right now also with the pandemic. Uh uh we are sharing an experience together, so I I guess it helps to develop empathy with your neighbors and people further because you, you have an understanding at least that we, we shared that little yep. slash big experience uh, together yeah oh and um the the other projects i'm working on because of course i'm working on multiple projects um so i'm currently developing a game called sig city of blades which is a follow-up to my previous game uh sig manual of the primes so SIG is a game that replicates the feeling of planar fantasy role-playing game, cough, cough, Planescape. Um, and SIG City of Blades is adapting that fictional setting to work for the Blades in the Dark system. Ooh, that's a nice combo. That's a very nice combo. So it's planar heists, which is a lot of fun. Oh, um, oh yeah. That so you so you go. Is it when you say planner? Uh, is it I don't I know. Is it like sliders or or the uh, strange so or? There is a fictional city in the center of reality that is hooked into the eternal planes of existence, like the um, plane of fire, the plane of lore, the plane of life, uh, etc. Uh, plane of shadows, and um, there's tethers and gateways to these uh, planes and there's also gateways to the infinite prime worlds where all the mortals live but the the gameplay focuses on this city between this this city um, of feuding factions um, but occasionally you'll do heists and steal into the land of the dead and rescue uh someone uh bring them back to the city between that's it's nice. a heist it's a planar heist you just happen to be doing an edifice heist so i have, in my experience in roping you had troubles with heist but i think blades in the dark sorted it although i haven't played blades in the dark yet my my problem with heist is that in my experience we spend a lot of time planning the heist and uh, since it reminds me of my work again, planning something as a yep. group <laughs> in space and with different levels of uh, different skill sets, uh, it's already sort of a problem for me. It's not exactly my enjoyment. But second, I found out even as a game master, uh, you plan if so. If you you spend a lot of resources and time to plan the heist, so there's two possibilities. It doesn't go according to plan, so the time you invested in planning wasn't that that well used, or it goes accordingly to plan, and it's actually very boring. So is it? Is so it? Yeah. How does that work? It, a blade solves that problem very well. So allow let's let us together uh, do the entire planning process for Blades in the Dark. Okay, so you are planning on doing an infiltration. Awesome. Uh, into this building. What is the point of entry? How are you getting into this place? I think it's a rather large building, and if I rent a room at that hotel, I should be able to uh, shoot a grapple hook to the roof and, and enter via a vent. Fantastic. You have now uh, finished that. Now let's roll one die. Oh, yep. Looks like we got a five. So um, your uh, initial setup works fairly well and you're in a controlled position. So you mostly have things under control. If it had been a one, you might have uh, run into a series of uh, guards who happened to be playing cards in the room that you grappled into. Um, but, I had, it. but I had you planned for that. Because uh, <laughs> yes, so you have a uh, a resource called stress that you gain during heists, and you can spend that to do flashbacks and really and need to try establish that. things and contingencies that you had you clearly already prepared. Uh, yeah, really and that to... was literally the entire planning process we had. 
I really need to ice. try that. I got a naked sun running behind me. I think it's about time uh, I, I sadly uh, end this show. Uh, it was really, really nice uh, to meet you for the first time and have a, a conversation. Oh, it's, it's uh, some rage going on to my yesterday. Uh, <laughs> ah, behind me, I'm losing my word. Uh, do you have anything, uh, final thing to, to plug? Where, maybe where where and when uh, people can find Palenquin? And because where can I continue to be working on everything. Um, I also work on uh, Fate, of, Fate of the Galaxy, a game of galactic space politics uh, powered by Fate Core. And uh, Circles of Power, my game of uh, social justice wizards. Um, which is uh, a Powered by the Apocalypse game where you're all playing um, members of various marginalized communities who are using magic to fight up, to beat up fascists and an oppressive um, regime. So yeah, I'm working on things. Uh, you can find me over on Twitter frequently where I'm doing very large threads uh, during the pandemic. Uh, which is at Genesis of Legend. Uh, you can see my website at um, uh, www.genesisoflegend.com uh, or .ca. Uh, and uh, you can also check me out on the RPG Design panel cast, uh, which you can just Google and you'll find fairly easily. Uh, so yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks f to everyone who listening to this or watching us. Uh, next Monday, we will be with a, a gentleman, another gentleman I never uh, interacted with before, someone from Onyx Path, and uh, I don't even remember. I'm horrible. I don't remember the name of that person. I'm just a horrible person, but uh, he seems extremely interesting and keen. Thanks again, uh, Jason, and uh, yeah, bye, everyone. See you around. Bye, everyone.